you know, the last time I checked, there was 61 names for sugar on the internet uh, meant for food labels. So sometimes people don't realize they're absorbing and eating substances that are just not good for our mental health. Hey everybody, Dr. Axe here. Welcome to the show. Today I have a guest I am really excited to talk to. Uh, it is Dr. Uma uh, Nadu, and she's a medical doctor. And we're going to talk about her, uh, we're going to talk about lots of stuff, but she is an expert in how to fight depression, anxiety, PTSD, OCD, ADHD, and so much more. And she's an expert as well on brain health. So we're going to talk about everything brain. She's not going to talk about food as medicine. And so honored and excited to have her with us today. Dr. Uma, hey, thanks for being on the show. Hey, Dr. X. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Well, great. Well, we're going to talk again, I know, about a lot of things regarding how to improve our mood using food as medicine. And we're going to talk about some of the things in your new book, which I'm excited about. You have a new book out called, This Is Your Brain on Food and how food actually affects our brain. So I know we're going to dive into all of this stuff here as well. But, you know, one of the first things I'd love to ask you is, you know, your background uh, is really as, is as a medical doctor. You had a conventional um, training. So, so what sort of got you more into this natural health space and using food to actually treat conditions like depression and anxiety? So I think it probably starts somewhere in my childhood because uh, I, I grew up around uh, you know family that loved food and food was love and nurturance. But I also grew, on, grew up around Ayurvedic principles and sort of using food in a healing way. Um, I'm not an Ayurvedic practitioner, but you know when you grow up around those types of understandings of food, I think you carry them forward. And then in residency, I found that at the end of the day, I would look forward to cooking a meal because it was my part of the part of the day that I could relax and de-stress. And it began to be more curious to me, you know, what the impact on the body and mind was beyond what we learned in medical school and, and what we study. And there's a huge gap in nutrition in, in our schools, um, you know, in, in our medical schools. So I decided to just think more about that, read more about it. And I found myself, as I learned to prescribe psychiatric medications, feeling more and more responsible that if I was going to give a needed medication to someone, they also needed to know the side effects. So I began to talk about lifestyle changes and reading more about that and seeing what was out there in the literature. So it was very much a uh, started off as really personal interest and my my detour to culinary school and studying nutrition all just part of wanting to enhance my knowledge of everything because I felt that I was going to make recommendations I wanted to know what I was to have a little bit of knowledge behind it and um, then I found it I really loved it and I, when I started to see positive changes um, I began to do it more. And that that's how I evolved into the field. Well, I love that. And I'm a huge fan of Ayurvedic medicine. You know, I've studied a lot myself and and used that even in the past when I used to take care of patients in my clinic many years ago. So let's, yeah, so let's let's dive in and talk about that. So growing up, uh, you know, your was it your mom, your dad, like who was using the Ayurvedic herbs, the cooking? Like how how did you learn some of this growing up? So it was it was around me, and I I I'm not probably not as a specialist like you are, Dr. X, because I didn't go ahead and study it more formally. But um, I had relatives. So my mom's actually a double boarded medical physician, um, and my dad was in business. So it wasn't really that they practiced it, but you know we grew up in a very large extended family. So I had an aunt and an uncle who practiced this, and I, I was around it all of the time. So I sort of feel like I absorbed yeah. that sense of what it was about. And I, I guess I went the traditional route, so I didn't didn't end up studying it formally. But I, I feel like I've imbibed that in a certain way. Yeah. And, um, you know, parts of our, our cooking and food were just naturally turmeric and, you know, black pepper and chili peppers and ginger and garlic and a lot of things that, you know, um, may may not fall into or maybe to fall into a particular group in Ayurveda, but, but in terms of now what we know about health and nutrition and improving how we feel, actually were ingredients of that diet initially. And now I understand a lot more about it. I love it. Well, I think, you know, this kinesthetic learning or learning from our families is one of the, you know, you know, essentially mentorship is one of the greatest ways you can learn. In fact, I think I, I learned more through being mentored and through watching others and having conversations with doctors who are older than me or more experienced than me 
I, I learned more than that than I, than I did in school. So I think that's a great, obviously it's a, it's a fantastic way to learn. You know, one of the things that you've really done an amazing job and a great work with is your study and looking at the link between nutrition and mental health. So can you walk us through a little bit what, what, you know, what caused you to discover this sort of connection and what is that relationship? Like how much does nutrition affect our mental state? You know, it's, um, it's, such, a, it's such a big question because to some extent, um, I happened upon it mostly because of what I was reading, some of what my mentors were already, already studying at Mass General and, and by observations that I made when I was prescribing medications for patients as part of both the therapy and psychiatric practice. And I talk about this in my book, but you know, this is one day a patient came in and he was all upset because he, he was blaming me for um, uh, having gained some weight because I had, we had started a medication in SSRI and he really needed it at the time. He was quite depressed. But he also walked in with, you know, the, our favorite coffee in, in, in Boston. One of our favorite coffees is Dunkin' Donuts. It, it originated in the Massachusetts area. And uh, it was a lot size. It was 20 ounce size. And I said, for some reason, very instinctually, I sort of said to him, well, why, why don't we talk about your coffee? And I wasn't trying to distract him. I was going somewhere with it. And we, we kind of un, 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 um, unpacked it a little bit. And it turns out we calculated he had more than a quarter cup of, of cream in it and six to eight teaspoons of sugar. And from that, I was able to learn both in the moment and with him that maybe there were other reasons contributing to this. I wasn't denying that this could be a side effect, but I was also saying, what about changes we could start to make? And when I found that those slight tweaks started to make changes, I started to include it in all my conversations with patients. And, it, it, you know, in the last decade, nutritional psychiatry has gotten its sort of name, but Many integrated and functional medicine, uh, of I should say functional psychiatrists, uh, practitioners who have been looking at this from the perspective of an integrated type of mental health, but also a root cause, um, I, I think have been doing this kind of work for a very long time. When I started to notice that even those simple things, like, you, you know, many of us know a ton of sugar is not good for us. But as I started to learn that when I made these tweaks, people actually improved their scores on anxiety, on depression, and started to feel emotionally better enough that some people, not everyone, but some people I could cut back on some of the doses of the medications, and they were noticing a difference, and they wanted to change more. Um, and as I learned more and understood more, you know, I realized that the, the gut and the brain was a huge part of this. And as I understood that connection more, more from an anatomical and a biochemical and all of those good things and the vagus nerve being, being that it connects everything, I then understood the research better around how serotonin receptors, more than 90% of them are in the gut. So what you eat goes to, goes to the gut and as it gets metabolized, if it's bad foods, it's going to affect your brain negatively because there's, a, there's that bi-directional pathway through the vagus nerve. So, you know, that was, that was, that's a long answer, but it's sort of the basis of how I, I, came, I, I sort of came to do it now in my everyday life. I love that. So let's go ahead and dive in and start talking about this. Let's talk about what diets negatively affect our mental state or what what diet, what food specifically, what things we expose ourselves to, and, 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 and then how does that specifically affect us? Sure. So, you know, it, it's not probably not going to be a surprise that when we, a lot of our nutrition, nutritional epidemiology studies look at this, compare everything to the standard American diet, which I'm not sure that I agree with because it's not the healthiest diet. I think we know that. Um, but it, it's, it's the, you know, the, um, the, the level of processed foods, the added sugars, um, the, the additives, preservatives and stuff that we don't even realize have them. You know, the last time I checked, there was 61 names for sugar on the internet uh, meant for food labels. So sometimes people don't realize they're absorbing and eating substances that are just not good for our mental health. But it's also the fact that there are things like, like um, you know, cured meats um, have, depending on, on the process, and, and some of the newer versions now do it a little bit better, have nitrates in them. And nitrates have been shown to negatively impact mood. So knowing those, those some of those things are, are super helpful. So one, one of the things that we, tr we try to make useful in the book is foods to avoid and foods to embrace. And there is some overlap 
as you can imagine, because a lot of the mechanism of this is through the gut-brain axis, and serotonin is one of the main neurochemicals, um, as well as dopamine, gabapentin, and others, but it is one of the main ones. So it isn't a surprise that there will be some overlap of foods. But there are certain things that, you know, you should, you should just basically not be eating a ton of, and although we... Uh, and encourage sort of a more, uh, uh, I would say, a really whole foods diet. And remembering that with mental health, people are already walking to my office struggling with significant feelings that are difficult to cope with. So asking them initially to eliminate something is harder. Once, they're, once their gut is healed and they're in a better place emotionally, they might then choose to do a more diversified diet or a, more, a diet where they ex exclude some type of food in order to feel better. And so, you know, it's, it's a very highly personalized plan because when you think about it, our guts are so highly unique. So, so it makes sense that you have to figure out something for that individual. Absolutely. So can you talk to me about what are some of the biggest foods? So, you know, some of the foods in your book, the do not eat list, okay. what, 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 what are some of those big foods and food categories? Okay. So things like, you know, um, the foods that have glutamates um, because they drive anxiety, they worsen ADHD. The, um, the nitrates in, um, in, in, so we think about processed foods, but we don't always realize they have nitrates. The unhealthy fats in foods, the additives, colors, dyes. We may, we may know, uh, Dr. X, that, you know, we should eat fried foods or we shouldn't, you know, we should try to stay away from uh, fast foods. But what we try to do is also unpack the science behind it so that we try to make a pretty compelling argument for people as to the fact that these bad foods definitely impact your mood in a certain way. So there's a cool fact, for example, of tryptophan and how it's absorbed. You know, we, we found studies that showed that tryptophan is well and good, and it's part of the serotonin, um, how serotonin is made. But here's the thing, if, it, if it's not paired with some type of, and it can be a low GI carbohydrate, um, it, the absorption is affected. So, you know, if you're going to have those sources of tryptophan, have it with um, something that is very, very, uh, that has some carbohydrate in it because it will give you the positive impact. So those are the little, the, the little tweaks. You know, then there's things like turmeric and black pepper. We found, you know, we, we, we show people why it is that the curcumin, um, the absorption, I think is something like thousands of percent uh, improved by the pepperine from black pepper. So we ask people to add that to a smoothie or soup to whatever it is that you want to eat it, even if you don't cook with it. And it's those little sorts of tips and tweaks that we try to do, um, you know, for, 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 each, for each disorder. Wow. So, so the foods that are going to really affect our brain negatively. So, you know, are we talking about sugar, hydrogenated oils, Mm -hmm. How about artificial sweeteners? Like, you know, talk, yes. talk to me about some of those too. Sure. So, so, you know, the, uh, and I'm sorry, for me, when I, when I say bad, bad fats, I mean those sort of hydrogenated oils. I'm and sure. I okay. That. So hydrogenated oils, the, the, you know, the bad fats encouraging the healthy fats. So sweeteners actually is super interesting because we recently wrote um, an article that looked at, we looked at a review of things that help anxiety. And we found that uh, there are two sweeteners that, maybe if you're really finding it difficult to come off sugar, that you could start with these and then over time really try to choose, take less and less of them. Um, so stevia and erythritol probably are things that are not as bad because of their impact on insulin. But over time, my encouragement would be really to move towards natural sources than, um, than, than those. Um, but what we found when we looked at anxiety is that the other artificial sweeteners actually drive anxiety. So they are, you know, if you think that you're drinking a can of Coke and you want to go to Diet Coke, maybe not the best idea because if you're trying to feel less anxious, you really, really want to start making some slow and steady changes to even get, get you off those artificial sweeteners. That's great. Well, let's dive in and talk about some of the top foods that can help. And, and then I want to jump into some specific conditions. Let's talk, about, uh, let's talk about the foods we should eat. What are some of the biggest food categories that you've seen especially according to clinical research, help support our brain health and our mood? Sure. So, you know, I think that let, let's start with um, mood and anxiety because those are the commonest conditions. Um, it, it, won't be, it also won't be a surprise that we're going to suggest, you know, things, things for mental health patients with a sort of whole foods, 
um, including plant-based and healthy lean proteins type of diet. Why? Because omega-3s in, in um, sources of salmon, mackerel, tuna, herring are all great sources of omega-3 and they help both mood and anxiety. Now, now, many people know about the mood factor. We, people may take a supplement for that, but it also helps anxiety, and it's been shown in human research to do that. Um, you know, the prebiotics and probiotics, uh, giving people examples and helping them incorporate that in a regular way is super helpful. And why is it? Because a lot of these recommendations around mood are fiber-rich or foods that help the gut bacteria. And between the fiber and the prebiotic and probiotic met, um, uh, contents of those food, they regulate the gut towards a positive balance and not the negative balance of dysbiosis. Because what happens in the dysbiosis and with over time inflammation setting in and leaky gut setting in, and often people may come to my office and present with new onset of panic, which I've seen, but as I, I try to get a proper history from them, one of the things they're suffering with is really severe gut symptoms, le leading to the understanding that this may actually be a lot of inflammation um, that is causing a lot of stress in the gut and therefore leading to other symptoms that have then secondarily presented as, as the so-called brain symptoms. Things like turmeric with black pepper, saffron. There's a significant amount of evidence around saffron and depression. Saffron is a super expensive spice. It's delicious. It's super expensive. So the amount of saffron, um, like we talk about in the book, is probably too much to consume and too expensive. So in that instance, we say that, you know, if you want to speak to your doctor about a supplement, that might be worth it because there's significant evidence around that. Oregano is another spice. And these are easy to incorporate in whatever type of food you like because they're salt-free, sugar-free, low-calorie or no-calorie. And these are things you can add into your foods, um, uh, 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 you know, easily. So, so the other the types of tea that help mood um, include chamomile. And many people think, oh, it's you know something to calm me down at night and help me sleep. But it actually also helps mood. So we, you know, we try to uh, we, we try to we try to look at what's out there, but also provide some of the evidence behind it. We know that leafy greens have a rich in folate and multiple vitamins. So the things that have your, vi your B vitamins in them are naturally going to drive your mood in a positive way. Um, so, you know, we, we, the, the, with, 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 I would say with depression, it's, it's pretty, um, pretty well understood, or I should say pretty well researched. And anxiety also has, a, has I think, the, the evidence is growing. Uh, we also found with anxiety that it's omega-3s, turmeric and black pepper. It's um, some, there are a couple of studies um, that are newer that looked at possibly the impact of a low keto diet helping anxiety. And we really want to understand and learn more about that. So I think that was cool. Um, but at the same time, we, we were speaking, you know, we also talked about avoiding things like sweetness, as you just mentioned, and other things that then will just, um, and also in the studies of anxiety, foods that had gluten were impacting anxiety in a negative way. Wow. So I heard several things that people can start doing today. One, turmeric, you mentioned several times, which is fantastic. I love, we love that. Herb. There's so much clinical research there. You talked about getting more healthy fats. You talked about keto as well, mm -hmm. getting your omegas, reducing inflammation. So we talked about, again, you know, uh, wild caught fish, walnuts, chia seeds, flax, maybe even some, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of uh, other forms of fat, whether it be olives, avocados, maybe some coconut, that sort of thing. And then a saffron, you're, I mean, saffron, what amazing natural remedy there as well. So uh, love those recommendations, really good. And um, yeah, it's interesting, you know, the, you know, keto, of course, is continuing to grow in popularity, especially in the medical community. Um, and, uh, again, I think that's, uh, anyways, great recommendations, but let, let, let's chat a little bit about, so you mentioned depression, you mentioned anxiety. Uh, let, let's talk about some of the other conditions. Are there any other studies or any other things that you cover in your book as well about some of the other conditions, maybe any type of specific foods that may be surprising that have been shown to help uh, any type of mood disorder, whether it be OCD or, or bipolar or, or some of those conditions. 
So interestingly, there's some newer research is picking up on the keto, some newer research, and I, I do think more studies are needed, I'm sure you will agree as well, yeah. but understanding that some um, keto, ketogenic diets have helped individuals um, with the metabolic issues in things like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and major mental illness. So I really am excited about where that research is going to go and develop. You know, the surprising things, things are, um, you know, blueberries have been shown to have some significance in trauma-related issues. And we talk about the antioxidant effect. And, and I think people, especially your audience, and w- wouldn't understand, uh, would know that type of stuff. But, you know, it's interesting that it can have, I always feel if something can have a double barrel effect for you, why not? Um, you know, if, if, if turmeric can have five or six different positive effects, why not? So that that was, that was cool. You know, we've, I've talked, touched briefly on the glutamate. And I think that just simple things like when you go to a Chinese restaurant, asking for, um, you know, the, the, the low or no glutamate options is definitely something you want you want to think about if you're struggling with any of these symptoms um, with uh, you know we found that in uh, some of the studies about ADHD surprising and contrary to what you might think the it wasn't actually thought to be the sugar level that was and, and by no means are we encouraging kids to eat a ton of sugar but it wasn't actually those the, the studies didn't pan out that that sugar impacted hyperactivity uh, there were other mechanisms involved so you know it's it's it's, it's sort of you you glean these really interesting and unusual uh, facts. I think that one of the um, one of the compelling things that I think brought it back to the gut microbiome and how important it is in mental illness was a study that was done. And and you know we I understand and feel that in nutrition. Uh, nutritional science, nutrition epidemiology, a, a study that is a smaller number than, say, a pharmaceutical trial, which is highly funded by billions of dollars, is not necessarily a study that we shouldn't pay attention to. I think we have to interpret the information and give it a fair chance. And if it's if it's flawed in some way, then then we can always find out. You know, we can always say that. But I mention this because some of the research, uh, some of the research, not all. We we had plenty. Of, you know, we looked at seven hundred articles and about 550 made it into the book, Um, but a good percentage of those were human trials. But the one I want to mention was actually done in mice and it looked at the microbiome. They transplanted, um, uh, they did a fecal uh, transplant of uh, individuals with schizophrenia into mice and into into germ-free mice, so they, they didn't yet have a microbiome. And these mice developed symptoms of schizophrenia. Um, and I think that just again goes to prove the, the, the importance of what is coded in the genetics and in the microbiome and the you know 39 trillion bugs that live in our gut. Um, and therefore, you know, paying attention to just healthy eating and some of those uh, very basic rules that we sometimes forget, you know, the, the beans, the, the nuts, the legumes, the healthy seeds, a lot of that stuff really does impact the gut. So it's now more than ever important to, uh, to, to pay attention to those. Yeah, great advice. One of the things I love to talk about as well, in, in addition to some of the nutritional aspects that you've mentioned, uh, is h- how are emotional reactions and these sort of things can affect our, and I think it's obvious, but our mental health. When you have somebody come in, are there any, w- w- what are some of the things you do that's non-nutrition, non-medicine related to help people overcome conditions like anxiety and depression? Like if somebody comes in and they're having anxiety and depression, what are some of the non-medical and nutritional things that you do to help them overcome the, the problem? That's a great question. You know, I, I spoke earlier about a root cause and, and part of it is because um, I approach psychiatry in an integrated um, sort of functional way and always try to find what's beneath the surface that's going on. And in that way, I feel that if someone enters my office, just like you you think of a plate of food, we don't just eat one type of food um, uh, all the time. I mean, you, you may have one meal, but, um, uh, you know, so in terms of the whole body and the whole body system, it's not just one fact. And we really cannot be siloed about mental health versus gut health versus, um, you know, cardiovascular health. In a similar way, my model is very holistic. And so I want to know how people are sleeping. Are they paying attention to sleep hygiene? Are they moving? A severely depressed patient who comes in having gained weight 
may not be able to exercise. So I have to talk to them about movement. Are there small things you can do so that you can eventually get into an exercise program? And then things like, you know, simple things like hydration, mindfulness, meditation, um, you know, uh, types of movement that help low anxiety and stress, yoga, tai chi, qigong. Uh, are, are there any things in that that you might enjoy doing that you, can, you, you might feel you can? And I, I do think that even things, for one thing with anxiety, I always want people to be forming an, some type of therapeutic relationship, either with myself or someone else trained in psychotherapy, um, because that's an important element of reducing anxiety. The, huge amount of research behind how that can help reduce symptoms. But then there are wonderful things like um, apps that people can use, breathing exercises. Um, you know, I just said to a young researcher on my team today who was getting back to me with some information and had a terrible morning, the fire alarm had gone off and all sorts of things had happened and he was very, very frazzled. And I, I just, you know, I just said, stop and take a deep breath. Just Take a deep breath. And the power of those simple interventions when someone is feeling overwhelmed and anxious, especially at a time like now, I, don't, I think cannot be underscored enough. And we may sometimes glance over them and go to something that seems more, more serious or, 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 or anything like that. But it's actually important. Um, and, and I think that uh, even some of those uh, studies are panning out now in terms of meditation, mindfulness, and lowering uh, anxiety levels. Yeah, I think it's amazing. I think as you're saying, I read a study recently on meditation and how, and that, how that can affect uh, anxiety specifically. And so I love uh, I, I love, love some of those treatments that are obviously, uh, not invasive things where people can kind of take, you know, can, can take control of their own health, you know, and, yeah. and, uh, and support themselves. And so I love that. Tell me a little bit more about your book. Okay. So you got a new book out. It's called, this is your brain on food. What are some of the things that I haven't asked that you really cover in the food that you think are so critical for people to understand when mm -hmm. it comes to mental health? Sure. Um, so what we what we did, Dr. X, is we we kind of divided the book into the we you know we give an introduction around how the gut brain uh, the chapter is called the gut brain romance, and then we talk about how that happens, and we build it up for people. Then we break down the different disorders, and at the end we have a whole recipe of how to set up your kitchen. You know, I I, I, I couldn't not do this because being a chef, I just felt like I wanted to share what I would do, and then recipes that kind of go along with each chapter. So we try to use the foods from the chapter, and just have some simple menus and recipes to work on on the end. But with each chapter, you know, we go from depression and anxiety all the way to libido, and and uh, we look at foods to, to embrace and foods to avoid. We look at sleep. Uh, we break down OCD and ADHD. We also look at fatigue, brain fog, um, you know, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, schizophrenia, all, all the sort of uh, big topics. And, you know, we, we look at memory, we look at cognition and, uh, and things like that. So, so hopefully, you know, if a person has one condition or has a family member or friend with something, you can still pick up the book, go to that chapter. There's some overlap of the foods, but with each one, we try to just unpack it so that a person can go and get it for that chapter, but also use other, other resources in the book. And, you know, we, I sincerely hope it'll be, it will be helpful to people that they can grab onto um, new foods, new ideas that they can try out to feel better. You know, one of the things I know, Dr. Uma, is when I've, you know, taken care of people over the years is sleep can affect, I've seen this, I know, hey, I'm going to talk about myself here and my wife, we just had a newborn or a, you know, a baby not just not too long ago. And I've definitely gotten less sleep, okay, than I'm used to. I'm sure all parents out there get that. You know, I think for a lot of people, if they're not sleeping, that can affect their mental health. Talk to me a little bit about sleep, how that can affect our mental state. And also, are there any herbs, any foods that you found to be very good to also help 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 improve sleep? Sure. So um, the interesting thing about sleep is that um, tart, tart cherries are supposed to help sleep. Mm -hmm. So if you can find, uh, rather than go for juice that may have a lot of added sugar, if you're not making it, maybe find some, even if they're frozen, tart cherries and, and have that as part of your snack or juice that you make on your own. So that's supposed to be super helpful. And I think it was not something that I knew you before going into the research around it. Um, but here's the thing, in, in mental health, 
poor sleep can be a very, very important um, diagnostic tool because if someone with bipolar disorder comes into your office or calls you up or pages you and says, I haven't slept, it could be a very big warning sign for a manic episode where someone is just, their, their mood cycle is changing and flipping over in the wrong way. Separate to that, you know, stress, um, anxiety, a newborn, uh, even if it's a pleasurable experience, sometimes all these things do affect how we're sleeping. And over time, someone who's just not sleeping poorly related to illness or, or something else, um, you know, the hunger hormones change. They, they change in the way that our hunger hormones don't know when to shut off. And people start to eat differently and they're sleeping poorly and they're eating more during the day, then they're gaining weight, then they, their breathing could be impacted when they're sleeping. Um, so, so it becomes almost a vicious cycle. So going back to what, you know, you, what we spoke about earlier, that's where mindfulness becomes a huge component of also managing stress because I find that individuals, especially now, are just not sleeping well for different reasons. And I know from the nutrition aspect, if they're sleeping poorly, it's going to affect their uh, hunger hormones, it's going to affect their, their stress, is going to kick in and it's going to affect their gut and then they're going to have many more mental illnesses um, that could ensue even if they don't meet diagnostic criteria, they just won't feel good. So sleep is one of those things that just, you know, I think is, is super important to, uh, to get regulated. And if you're not sleeping poorly, to try to pay attention. Great advice. You know, one of the other things too, I love that you've mentioned, because this is me. When I used to run my full-time practice years ago, my stress reliever is to immediately like walk in the door and start making food. Like every yeah. night I would make a big meal and it just, it was like my stress reliever. And I loved it. It brought me joy. And when I got married, Chelsea was like, you just worked all day. Like, why are you, you're coming home now and you want, you want to make food? And I'm like, she's like, for me, that's the last thing I'd want to do. For me, it's like, no, that is literally the thing yeah. that is like giving me life I and energy it. right now. That was me in residency. You know, it was, it was kind of how I mentioned growing up in a large Indian family and, uh, I, I, you know, having lots of, lots of cooks in the kitchen. So for me, it was really a journey. And it was my, my, my almost my meditation, so to speak, after work. It was a great, great time for mindfulness. I didn't realize it at the time, but that's, that it was really helping my stress uh, after a busy day of work, you know, so. So, so like today, you know, if you get home now, like what are some of your favorite meals over the years? uh that you know you love to make sort of you know in the kitchen so, sure so i um probably you know this is this is tough uh this is tough because i have so many favorites and i obviously love food so um i love to take any so so i like to take any dish whatever it is and be able to change it up with spices so for example um, one of the things that I did in culinary school was I took, you know, traditional samosa and I filled it with, with duck confit, but I also used Indian spices in it. So, so that's the concept wow. of something where I, I take a simple idea and I use a fusion, uh, just understanding and loving spices as much as I do to change it up a little bit and play with that flavor profile. In a similar way, you know, I might like on a certain day, I might like to make a cauliflower steak as one of the dishes, but I'll figure out or mix a, a, what a masala that someone would use for chicken tikka or for tandoori and, you know, use the healthy probiotic yogurt in there with the with, with the marinade that I create, but make it with the cauliflower, you know, or whatever it is. So I've done that with salmon. I've done that with tons of different types of food. Um, so I, that probably is, or if I'm making a chia pudding for breakfast, I'll put cardamom in it. So mm -hmm. I'll use, you know, the spices that my grandmother used to make chai at home and blend them in a certain way, but add them to the chia pudding. So it brings in a different flavor um, to it. And that's probably the most amount of fun I have is switching it up all the time and kind of challenging myself to what different flavor profile I can create with a with, with similar dish. You know, it's interesting. I think that we, um, we, don't use, we use far less herbs and spices in America today than I think a lot of, a lot of other countries, especially when you're looking at countries in the East. In fact, my neighbors growing up were from India. And so anytime I went over to their house, like I loved, they were making curry dishes, which I just loved. I mean, it was so good, but you know, we, we had, you know, they used so many herbs and spices. They use so many herbs and spices in their cooking. Right. And I have a friend today from, uh, from Israel 
And uh, he's an acupuncturist here. And my wife, Chelsea, and I go to his house all the time. And he's making these Israeli dishes, yeah. which is some of the best food I've ever had, you know, so. It's super delicious. Yes. No, it, and it's, it, uh, you know, it, it's exactly as you said. I think that, I think we could, I think if one way to help ourselves nutritionally is to actually broaden our, our spice cabinets just because it's an easy way to make the foods that people might say, oh, my doctor's saying this again. I should eat greens. I should, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you should eat more vegetables or, or, or bring in these, these healthy, you know, lean proteins. But again, you can change it up. You can make it super exciting for yourself and um, an easy way to do that without adding any negative ingredients um, uh, to your diet like we talked about earlier, spices. Yeah, I love it. In fact, you know, when I've taught lectures over the past few years, one of the things I've really talked about is, you know, up until 150 years ago, even I'd even say 70 years ago in the United States, when somebody used the word medicine, they meant herbs and spices. That throughout history, you went to an apothecary. If you went to an apothecary, what'd you find? Herbs, spices, maybe some uh, dried glandulars and organs. I mean, that's the sort of thing you would find. And so, you know, when we're talking about food as medicine, I mean, spices. And I know you talk a lot about spices in your book. I know even in your outline. And when I was, uh, you know, um, going through a little bit of your book, I saw you mentioning things like rosemary. I was so impressed with rosemary and all of the benefits for your brain and your nervous system. I know you get into turmeric, of course, and cover that. You talk about. Uh, some of the polyphenols, which are found in some different herbs, spices, of course, berries as well. Uh, capsaicin, you know, chamomile, right. I saw under the sleep. So I know you talk a lot about these herbs and spices in your book, which I think is fantastic as well. And hey, I want to encourage everybody, if you want to improve your brain health and your mood, which I think everybody can benefit from this, check out Dr. Uma's new book. It's called this is your brain on food. It's found in bookstores nationwide. Of course, you can easily just go online right now, go to amazon.com or barnesandnoble.com and you can order the book and you can find out just some great research, over 500 medical studies going through the benefits on how food affects your brain and your mood. And I want to say, Dr. Uma, I, I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show today and sharing your wisdom. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. X. It's so exciting to talk to you. Thanks again. Well, hey, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'll be back next week with another podcast. Another big thank you to Dr. Uma. And check out her book, This Is Your Brain on Food. Thanks, everyone. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed in this podcast are not medical advice and have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. In some cases, individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein.